Hey, here we are studying the Word of God. It's so good that you have joined us. We are studying the book of 2 Corinthians verse by verse, asking God to speak to our hearts, and we're going to pray, and then we'll get started. Father, we thank you so much for your Word. We ask that you would speak to us now. You tell us that your word is a living and active word, sharper than any two-edged sword, that you will actively speak to our hearts. You will reach to those deepest places within us. Lord, it's what we're asking that you will do now, that you would strengthen us, that you would speak to truth to us. Lord, we love you. We lift our hearts to you now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, all of our Bible studies are on our website, mzpraise, P-R-A-Y-S dot org. Go there, click Bible study, you'll find them all. They're also on our Facebook page, they're on my personal Facebook page as well. The new studies come up every Monday at 7 p.m. We are reading this letter of 2 Corinthians. We are in chapter 4 at verse 7. This is a letter that that man Paul wrote to a group of Christians in the city of Corinth. And he had a whole number of purposes for writing this letter. And we are reading through this letter, asking God to speak to us. Now, you know, we've said that reading these letters, there are a number of letters in the New Testament part of the Bible. And reading them is like listening to one end of a phone call. Uh, you're in a restaurant, somebody else is making a phone call. You can hear what the person right there is saying you can kind of figure out what the person on the other end is saying if you listen carefully to what the person here is saying. And that's the way reading these letters are. We can figure out what was, you know, what situation, for example, what situation in the church in Corinth is Paul addressing with this letter? What were their concerns? What were their needs? What is Paul responding to? And in kind of reading these letters in that way, we get a, a more complete picture. It, it brings these letters to life. So that's what we've been doing. Mostly we're asking God to speak directly to our hearts. So let's begin chapter 4 at verse 7. In the whole section just before this, the section that we covered last week, Paul is talking about the presence of the Spirit of God in our lives. When we put our faith in Jesus, the Spirit of God comes. Jesus said, I will pray to the Father and the Father will send the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. So the one God who is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Father sends the Spirit to our lives. And, and what happens? Instead of just saying, okay, I'll do better this time. I'll get it right this time. Now we have the presence of God in us to give us the strength, to give us the wisdom, to give us the courage, to give us the determination to obey God, to do the things God tells us to do, to be the people that he calls us to be. And so Paul was focusing on that in this whole section just before that. So look now here at this verse 7. He says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. So this treasure, we have the presence of God in our lives. We have the Holy Spirit in our lives. We have the glory of God, the, the character of God, the that the Holy Spirit is creating within us in our lives now. We have this treasure. We have the presence of Jesus in our lives. We have this treasure in jars of clay. What does that mean? Well, if you uh, lived in ancient times and you had a little bit of money, uh, they didn't have banks where you could go and put your money and hopefully get some interest, right? Invest your money in that way. Instead, you would have uh, maybe what we would call a safe, a strong box in your house, uh, and that's where you would put your money. You probably wouldn't put your money in a jar of clay, something that if a thief came, they could easily just throw the jar of clay on the floor. It would shatter, and they'd get your money. A jar of clay is something very fragile. So here Paul says, we have this treasure. We have the presence of God. We have the goodness of God. We have the character of God that he's creating in our lives in jars of clay, in our weakness. We are weak, he is strong. We'll see when we get much later in this letter, uh, the Lord says directly to Paul, uh, in your weakness, my power is perfected. In other words, you'll get strong when you know 
When you humbly realize how weak you are and you learn to rely on my presence in your life, that's when you'll get strong. That's when this treasure, the treasure of, of the, the Spirit of God uh, is, um, that the power from the treasure of God's presence in our life just multiplies. So he says, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Yeah, we have problems in life. We have struggles in life. Right? It, having the Spirit of God, having the Holy Spirit in me is not like this guarantee that I won't have problems, I won't have challenges, I won't have struggles, I won't have physical afflictions, etc., etc., etc. We have this treasure, the Holy Spirit, the presence of God in these fragile bodies of ours, in these fragile lives of ours to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us so that we don't ever start to think, look at me, look at me, look how strong I am, look how wise I am, look how courageous I am. What's Paul saying? No, we've got problem after problem after problem in our lives, and those problems keep us humbly dependent on the presence of God in our lives. And as we are humbly dependent on the presence of God in our lives, we get stronger. His power is multiplied within us. Now again, we've been seeing all through this letter, Paul is responding to someone back in Corinth, back in the city where this, these Christians are, who was trash talking behind Paul's back and saying, look at all the problems Paul has. Look at all the problems. That must mean he's not much of a man of faith. He doesn't know how to pray the way you all think he knows how to pray. That man was trash talking Paul behind his back. And so here Paul is saying straight up, no, we're, our physical bodies, our human existence here in this earth is fragile, like jars of clay. But inside these fragile bodies of ours, inside this fragile existence of ours in this life, is this treasure of God himself, the surpassing power of God in our lives. So when we see God at work, when we see God at work in us, we remember, this is not me. This is not because I'm so good, I'm so smart, I'm so strong. This is God at work in and through me. So at verse 8, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Look at that. We are afflicted in every way. Here's Paul saying, yeah, me, all of us. We are afflicted in every way. In other words, he's saying, look, putting your faith in Jesus, right? Making him the king, the Lord, the savior of your life, right? Opening the door of Jesus to your heart, right? Having the presence of God at work within you is not like some magic pill you take, some magic potion, right, that keeps away all the troubles of life. No, we are afflicted in every way. We have huge troubles in life. We're afflicted in every way, what? But not crushed. But the afflictions, the troubles of this life do not crush us, right? Because we have God at work in us. We have faith in our Lord who never gives up on us, who never abandons us, right? So no matter what affliction comes, we're not crushed. We're not giving up. We're not destroyed. We are afflicted in every way. So when affliction comes, we don't say, well, God, I guess you're not real. I guess this faith in Jesus stuff doesn't work. Jesus said it straight up. You will have tribulation, huge trouble. What did Jesus go on to say? Uh, but do not lose heart. I have overcome the world. He was saying to his disciples, look at me. You've seen all the, the trouble that has come to my life, the huge trouble that's come to my life. He's saying, take courage. You see me? Did I give up? Did I give up? No, I overcame it all. I overcame it all. It didn't destroy me at all. Yep, the trouble came and came and came. The afflictions come and come and come. But they don't reduce us then, what, to the, the anger the discouragement, the self-centeredness of this world, we overcome it all. We are not crushed by the afflictions of this world. So we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. 
perplexed, but not driven to despair. We don't understand. We don't understand the twists and turns of life. We don't understand why did that just happen? Why did that person just do that? Why has this happened to me? We're perplexed. We don't see it all clearly, right? But we are not driven to despair. But we are trusting that our God knows what he's doing. We are trusting that our God works all things together for good. That's what Paul wrote to the Romans. He works all things together for good for those who are called according to his purpose, right? So we're not driven to despair even when we don't understand. Maybe you're in some situation. You just don't understand. It doesn't make any sense. Don't let it drive you to despair. Instead, trust God. Trust that God knows the exact situation you're in. God knows what's going on. God's still got you. God's holding on to you. He's, he's not going to let you be crushed, right? Don't be driven to despair when you don't understand what's going on. Un know that God, trust that God understands. God is working out his purposes. What did we read earlier in this letter to the second letter to the Corinthians? He leads us always in triumph. It doesn't look like we're, we're moving forward in triumph, right? In those dark nights, in those hard times. It doesn't look like it, but our God leads us always in triumph. In other words, he always accomplishes his purposes through our lives. And you say, Pastor Craig, I can't find any purpose in this horrible thing that has just happened. Well, it's not that God causes the horrible things to happen. Maybe somebody did you some huge wrong. God didn't cause that person to do you some huge wrong, right? It's not that God causes all the horrible things in life to happen, but God will work. He will work it for good. He will bring his good purpose out of whatever mess is going on in this world. So we are not driven to despair. Hold on to that. Hold on to that. The worst thing, right? It's to despair. But there's been no point to this. There's no point in going on. There's no point in trying to do the right thing. There's no point in loving. There's no point in praying. No, we are not driven to despair. We are trusting our God. So at verse 9, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. Persecuted. We are done wrong. People do us wrong. People who are supposed to love us walk out on us. People who are supposed to be for us stab us in the back. People who, who we thought were our friends become our enemies. We are persecuted. Sometimes we're persecuted because of Jesus, right? People don't like the Jesus in you. People don't like the goodness of Jesus in your life because they're, you, the goodness of Jesus in your life is convicting them of the lack of the goodness of Jesus in their life. We get persecuted. We get done wrong. We get lied about. We get stabbed in the back. Paul was being trash-talked behind his back, right? We get persecuted, but we are not forsaken. But our God is with us. Our God is with us, right? You might walk out of me. You might leave me behind, but my God will never leave me. You might trash talk behind my back, but my God knows the truth. You might stab me in the back, might do me wrong, but my God is my strength, my courage, my determination. So, yeah, we are persecuted but not forsaken. God does not abandon us. Everybody might walk out on me. Everybody might turn their back on me and walk away. But my God will not forsake me. My God is with me. And so, again, we don't give up. We don't give up. We keep doing the right thing, the one next right thing. We keep doing the next thing that God tells us to do. You know, the next thing we read in his word, Sometimes yes, people will say, well, God told me to do this, and it has nothing to do with his word. No, we read the next thing that we hear in God's word, and we realize this is what God's telling me to do now, and we do it. It doesn't matter if we're being afflicted, we're perplexed, uh, we're being persecuted, done wrong. We don't, because we're not forsaken. God is with us. And then what does he say? Struck down, 
but not destroyed. Yeah, life will strike us down. Life will knock us off our feet. This is not an easy world by any means. This is not Disney World, right? This is not an easy, wonderful, perfect world. This is a hard world. This is a world full of tragedy, a world full of sin, a world full of wickedness. It's a hard, hard world. But we are not destroyed. Not destroyed. Right? So what did Jesus say? He said, look, uh, they'll, they'll take your life. Right? He said, he, so he said, like one time he said, not one hair on your head will be destroyed. Right? But he said right at the same time, he said, they'll take your life. So what, what does he mean? He means, look, they kill you. They take your life. Tornado strikes, you die, whatever, right? The next moment, you're opening your eyes and you're in the presence of Jesus. That's chapter one that just ended. But then is chapters two and three and four and five and all the rest. And what's beyond this chapter one? What's beyond this chapter one is now life, right? Life with him. Life in his presence. That means life without the tragedy and the disaster and the wickedness and the selfishness of this world, right? So that's why in this world, in this life right now, we're called to that place. Will I stay prideful and arrogant to him and say, I don't need a savior. I don't need a God telling me what to do. I don't need somebody to forgive me. All right, great. Then your chapters two, three, four, and five and all the rest will be without him. You don't want him, you won't have him. Or in this chapter one, will we get humble and say, I need you. Lord Jesus, I need what you did for me on the cross. I need the mercy and the forgiveness for my sin that you offer me. I need you to teach me how to live. I need you to give me your spirit, your Holy Spirit, because I don't have the strength to do it right. Will we stay prideful and arrogant and say, I don't need God and therefore not have him for all the rest of eternity? Chapters two, three, four, and all the rest or we will get humble before him and therefore be with him in all the rest of the chapters of our existence, have a humble heart, therefore not bring all the wickedness of this messed up sinful world to chapters two, three, and four of the life of, of God's people, right? And so, yep, in, in this world, we do get struck down, but we're not destroyed because even if they strike us down in death, we are not destroyed. We open our eyes the next moment, and there is Jesus for the beginning of chapters 2 and 3 and 4 and all the rest. So at verse 10, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. Always remembering the suffering of Jesus. In other words, always remembering how hard life hit him. In other words, when God himself came to this world, the Father sent, God the Father sent God the Son, Jesus, to this world. God comes to this world. He wasn't born in a palace with a perfect pampered life. He was born in abject poverty. His parents had to flee as refugees, right? He grew up in horrendous poverty there in Nazareth. It was hard, hard times. And then the suffering that came to him, the hatred that came against him, ultimately going to the cross and taking all the grief and all the sorrow and all the sin of the world upon himself. So we always carry in the body the death of Jesus. We remember that our Lord suffered. We remember the suffering that came to him. And maybe you read the Gospels, right, these biographies of Jesus, and you say, well, uh, he didn't have cancer the way I have cancer. You know, I don't see any, like, terrible disease that he had the way I have this terrible disease. Yeah, except that when he went to the cross, what? He bore all of our griefs, all of our sorrows, and all of our sin on himself there on that cross. So that was, you know, he was only on the cross for six hours of our time, but he was an infinite God. And so he went from the beginning of history to the end of history in those six hours. And all of the pain and all of the hurt and all of the sorrow and the sin and the wickedness of this world came on him, that infinite God. 
there on that cross. And what? He descended into hell with all of us. Utter and complete separation from the Father. Utter and complete. He descended into hell. To take all of that to hell. To pay the price of it all and leave it there. And leave it all there. There, the Father then raising him up. So we are always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. We're always remembering the suffering of Jesus so that when I'm going through a hard time, my Lord went through hard times. When I'm hurting, my Lord hurt. When people are talking behind my back, they talk behind my Lord's back. When people are hating me, they hated him. We're always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. We're always remembering the suffering of Jesus so that we don't then just say, well, this faith in Jesus stuff doesn't work because look at all these problems I have. No, we remember the problems that he endured, the pain that he endured, and we keep our faith. We keep looking to Jesus. We keep trusting in Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. We remember how the Father then raised him up from death to life. We remember then the promise that as he raised Jesus up, he will raise us up also. Yes, we will walk through, like everyone else on the face of this earth, we will all walk through the pain and the hurt of life in this world. But we don't give up our faith because we remember that the Father raised Jesus up, he will raise us up also. We remember that when we close our eyes in death, the next moment we open our eyes and there's Jesus. Then you're looking into the eyes of Jesus. You're looking into those eyes of perfect love. Then the perfect love of Jesus is healing all the hurt inside of you. It's that, that work that he began. What does Paul say? Uh, the good work that he began, he will bring to completion on the day of Jesus, right? On the day we see Jesus, that work is brought to completion. So we don't give up. Always carrying the body, the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies so that we don't give up and therefore the life-giving power of Jesus, the power of Jesus to give us courage, to give us strength, to give us determination, to give us wisdom, because we're not abandoning our faith in Jesus in hard times. He is present then so that we have all of this so that we're not crushed by affliction. We're not driven to despair when we're perplexed. Uh, we're not you know, forsaken when people turn against us. We're not destroyed when we're struck down because we're keeping our faith in Jesus. At verse 11, for we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So we are, oh, look at that. He says, always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. Always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. Wow, it's like, what? Wait, wait, wait. Maybe this is a verse you say to yourself. I don't want to hear that. <laughs> I don't want to hear that. We are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. In other words, God's not putting a magic shield of bubble around us, right, to, to prevent any harm, any hurt, any pain from coming to our lives. But we are walking through the pain of this world as Jesus did always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So he's kind of repeating verse 10, saying it in a different way. In other words, if I didn't walk through hard times, if I didn't get, you know, yes, yeah, struck down, afflicted, perplexed, right? What would happen to my faith? I'd begin to think, I got this. What would happen to my humble dependence on Jesus, I would begin to think, I got this. I can handle this. Hey, I'm getting pretty strong here. I'm getting pretty wise here. I know what I'm doing. I got the courage and the confidence and the determination I need. And so here's Paul saying, nope, the Lord's going to let you go through hard times so you stay humbly dependent on him. Humbly dependent on Jesus. Because Jesus knows there is so much more, more of his power, more of his goodness that comes to our lives that we can bring to this world around us when we stay humbly dependent on him. He knows that when we start to think, I got this, I got this, I got this, you know, that's the danger of, quote, success in life. 
People who become, quote, very successful sometimes are so very tempted, right? All of us. We have some success in our life, and we get tempted, right, to think, I got this. I'm a little bit smarter than other people. I'm a little bit better than other people. I got this. I got this. And here's Jesus saying, no, you don't. No, you don't. You stay humbly dependent on me every moment, every day. That's why I've said to this church, from the day I got here to this day, I have no idea what I'm doing. No idea what I'm doing. And I know you all say amen, right? I got, I got no idea what I'm doing. We stay dependent on Jesus every moment, every day. Why? Because the calling of Jesus in our life is so much greater than what we can ever figure out. The, the kind of love he's calling us to have for those all around us is so much greater than the kind of love that we figure out in this world. And so we have to stay humbly dependent if we're ever going to approach the kind of love that Jesus is calling us to. When he said, the things I do, you will do, and even greater things than I do, you will do. Wow, that's only if we say, Jesus, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to get there, Jesus. I need you. And so the problems in life, right, they help us stay humbly dependent on him. They knock us down a few pegs, right, so that we say, Jesus, help me. Jesus, help me. So at verse 12 then, so death is at work in us, but life in you. Now, what, is, what does Paul mean there? Well, he's clearly now responding to that situation in Corinth where that guy was talking trash behind his back. The biggest thing that guy was saying is, look at all Paul's problems. Look at all the problems he have. He must not be a man of faith. He must not really be the man of God that you all think he is. So Paul is responding to all of that trash talk because he knew that trash talk would lead the people of Corinth far away from this truth. Because what that guy was saying is, if you really have faith in Jesus, you won't have problems. You won't have problems. If you really have faith in Jesus, if you really know how to pray. And Paul knew that was not truth at all. As we saw last week, that was tampering with God's word. So now Paul kind of puts it in their faith. So death is at work in us. He means in myself, in those who are traveling with me. That guy, that's what he was saying. Yeah, he's saying, look at, look at the death in them. So Paul says, yep. Death is at work in us, but life in you? What's he saying? So, oh, so you got it all together. He's, he's making them think, right? He's kind of putting it in their face just a little bit here. He says, oh, so you got this all together. You know what you're doing. You got it all together, and you, you got this. You don't need hard times. You don't need troubles. Paul's asking them this question, right? Is that, is what, is that what you all have come to believe listening to that guy talking? He's saying, no, what you really need is for God to allow the hard times to come because they will keep you humbly dependent on Jesus, right? So at verse 13, since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we also speak. So... Uh, as we uh, said last week, Paul gets confusing here, doesn't he? Some of his sentences and paragraphs, they're going like this all over the place. So what does he say here? He says, since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. He says, we also believe and so we also speak. He's saying, I'm telling you what Jesus has spoken to my heart. I'm telling you, the I'm showing you in my words the faith that Jesus has created in my life. I'm not making up stories. I'm not making up some kind of religious talk that maybe would inspire you or something. I'm telling you what Jesus is doing in my life. I believed and so I spoke. I'm telling you the faith that he has created in me and I'm sharing that with you. You know, I, I learned a long time ago as a preacher if a preacher acts like they got it all together, or maybe they just humbly say, yeah, I don't, you know, we all need, I need Jesus. But, but they're basically kind of acting like they got it all together. Right? That's kind of like the captain of a ship, and the ship's going through a huge storm, like there's 
like a tsunami, right? And the ship, the waves are three times higher than the ship, and the ship's crashing, going through a storm. But if the preacher's acting like, I got this, this isn't hard. That's like the captain of a ship in a storm like that, just like, just whistling a happy tune in this huge storm. The crew would have no confidence in a captain like that. If a preacher acts like, I don't have problems. I got this. I got this handled. I can deal with this. I got this. It's good. I don't have problems. I pray. My problems go away. Then, no, you don't listen to that. Because what? We have tribulation. We have huge problems in this world. And here's Paul telling us again and again, and it's a good thing. Because they keep us dependent on Jesus, humbly dependent on Jesus. We remember how Jesus suffered, and so we don't give up. We, we rely then. What did he say? We saw back at the beginning of this letter when he was thrown to the lions. He said, we learn there to rely not on ourselves, but on God. And so here he's, he's saying, I'm telling you what God is doing in my life. He's saying, I'm preaching to you what Jesus preached to me. You know, as, as a preacher, I always preach to myself. I always preach to myself. A lot of times people will say to me, like, you just like said everything that's going on in my life this past week. I mean, over and over, people tell me that, right? Well, why is that happening? Because I'm always preaching to myself, and we're all the same. We are all the same, right? So if I'm preaching to myself, I'm preaching to a real person, right? I don't buy my sermons on the internet like a lot of preachers do, right? I don't do that. I don't, like, make up in my mind what I think people, how I think people are struggling, what I think they need to hear. I preach to myself because we're all the same. And you preach to yourself. You preach what Jesus has spoken in your life. You preach what, you know, the Word of God, how the Word of God has spoken uh, in your life, what God has done in your life through the Word of God. And then, right, people connect. And so that's what Paul's saying here. He says, uh, we also believe, and so we also speak. He's telling you, I'm telling you what's going on in my life. I'm telling you what the Word of God has done, what the Spirit of God has done in my heart, what the Word of God has done in my life. So at verse 14, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. He's saying, yep, I have walked through hard, hard times. I've gone through hard, hard struggles. Yep, I've been afflicted. Yep, I've been perplexed. Yep, I've been persecuted. Yes, I've been struck down. He says, and I'm telling you what Jesus has done through it all in my life. Yep, I was afflicted, but I was not crushed. I was perplexed, but I was not driven to despair. I was uh, persecuted, done wrong, but I was not forsaken. I was struck down, but I was not destroyed. I'm telling you what's happening in my life because I know that Jesus, Jesus is at work in and through all of this, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus. He's given me the courage and the strength. He's produced his life within me now as I walk through all these things, and I know that day is coming. When finally death, you know, I close my eyes in death, but the Father will raise me up beyond death. He says, so knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. He says, I know that not even death can conquer me because I am keeping my faith, keeping my faith in Jesus. So at verse uh, 16 or 15 then, Verse 15, for it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. It is all for your sake. He says, I've gone through all these struggles, all of these difficulties. He says, and I've kept my faith in Jesus through all of this. He says, it's all for your sake. God knew He's, Paul's saying to them, he says, our God knew that me walking through these struggles and, and the way that he would be at work in my life through these struggles would bring great blessing to you. Great blessing to you. He, he's saying, Paul's saying, God, 
Our God knew that. So he allowed me to walk through these struggles because he knew that I would get stronger. I would learn how to rely on him, not on myself. And he knew that, that uh, I would be transparent and share with you what's going on in my life and that you would be blessed because of it. So for it is all for your sake so that as grace extends to more and more people, he's saying my life is an example of the grace of God. The grace of God, that unearned, undeserved favor and love of God. He's saying, did, did I deserve Jesus to come to my life, to get a hold of my heart, to, to, to pull me up out of the hatefulness and anger and pridefulness that was in my heart before I knew him? He said, I didn't deserve that, but our God is a God of grace, and he came to my life. And he said, and have... Is, is there anything in me that has given me the strength to, to persevere through all these struggles that I've had, to keep on going? Is there anything in me that has given me the wisdom to know how to handle all these things that have come at me? He's saying, no, it's all the grace of God. I didn't deserve any of it, but God, but God came to my life. God brought forgiveness to my life. God sent the Holy Spirit to my life. He's saying, so it is all for your sake so that as grace extends to more and more people, right? He says, so I came preaching to you a message of grace, preaching to you a message of unearned, undeserved love, the unearned, undeserved love that comes from that cross. Jesus gave his life. We didn't deserve that. He brings forgiveness to our lives. He prayed, the Father sent the Holy Spirit. We didn't deserve that. But he said, I'm telling you what he's done in my life so that as this grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving. He says, there is so much gratitude in my heart. There's so much thankfulness in my heart. And there's so much thankfulness in the hearts of person after person after person who come to realize that it's the grace of God that saves us. What did Paul say when he wrote to the Ephesians? For by grace you've been saved through faith. By grace, you've been saved through faith. You remember, we started two weeks ago in that, you know, in chapter three, they are talking so much about uh, the, the commandments. The commandments, right? The purpose of the commandments ultimately, finally, was to show us we need God. We, even knowing the right things to do in life, we don't do them. We're not, we're rebels. We rebel against God. We're not strong enough. We're not wise enough because we keep rebelling against God. So the purpose of the commandments it's just to say, you need a savior. You need God to save you, to rescue you. And it's grace, it's grace. It's God's grace that he, he sent that savior. It's God's grace that he, he went to that cross. It's God's grace that he forgives our sin. It's God's grace that he sends the Holy Spirit to our lives to give us strength now and wisdom and courage and determination. So he says that as this grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Right? We give thanks and thanks and thanks to God. You know, before Paul, the Lord Jesus, got a hold of Paul's life, right, he thought he was the best guy around. He thought, he thought he was the most holy, the most obedient to God guy around, right? And was he giving glory to God? He was giving glory to himself. When I think I got this, I can do this, I'm a self-made man, when we think I'm so smart, I'm so strong, right? It's giving glory to ourselves. But when we realize I have no idea what I'm doing, I, I, I need him every moment, every day. That gives glory to God. So at verse 16 then, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. So whatever problems come in our lives, whatever the struggles are that we have, we do not lose heart. We do not lose our courage. He says, though our outer self is wasting away, yep, even our physical bodies get beat up by this world, right? We get beat up by life in this world. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. We keep our faith in Jesus we stay humbly dependent on him, humbly dependent on the presence of the Holy Spirit within us. We keep our focus on Jesus. 
And though the problems of this world, the struggles of this world, yeah, they beat our bodies down, right? Our inner being, our inner self is being renewed every day. Because what? This is chapter one getting us ready for chapters two and three and four and all the rest. So we are being renewed day by day. You know, I've often shared the story. Before I came to Mount Zion, I've been here 35 years. I was at another church down in East Baltimore for five years, and a very dear sister there, a woman who impacted my life, she spent the last number of years of her life in a nursing home, and it was not a very pleasant nursing home, and she didn't have family still uh, to come and visit, and I would go as the pastor of her church would go and visit her, and a few members of church would go and visit her. But every time I went to see her, every time I went to see her, what? She was filled with joy. She was filled with peace. Every time I went to see her, I was blessed. There she was, flat on her back, and couldn't get out of bed even in this nursing home. And not many people come in, not too many people come in to see her, right? But her inner being, right? Her heart was being renewed day by day. She kept her faith in Jesus. She kept looking to Jesus. She wasn't defeated. She wasn't destroyed by her outer self, her body, physical body, wasting away. That's the promise of our great Lord. Our Lord is at work always. The work he has begun in us, he will bring to completion when we see him face to face. So we don't give up. At verse 17, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So in some ways, what we're reading here this week and last week, Paul keeps repeating over and over and over again in different ways because it's so important for us to get this. He's saying it in all different ways because we need to hear this. So what, how does he say it this time? For this light momentary affliction, he's talking about the problems of life, the troubles of life. He says it's a light momentary affliction. Now, <laughs> life doesn't always feel that way, does it? When you're hurting badly in life, when you're struggling, it doesn't feel like a light momentary affliction. But here's Paul, here's our God saying to us through Paul's letter here, that's what it is, in fact. It's a light momentary affliction. It will be, in the blink of an eye, gone. Oh yeah, when we're gone through it, it seems like this just goes on and on and on and on. Right? But when we close our eyes in death, open our eyes the next moment, and we're with Jesus, it's like it was the blink of an eye. It's a light momentary affliction. Now, let's remember, Paul's not making light of our hardships and our difficulties. Because look at the hardships. He, he had the right to say this, right? Because look at the hardships and the difficulties of his life. So I've said over and over again, he was arrested again and again and again in that Roman Empire. Why was he arrested? Yes, because he was talking about Jesus. But why? Why would they arrest him? They believed in all kinds of gods in that Roman Empire. Because Paul was a Jew, an Israelite, a group that there was a whole lot of racism against. And he kept talking about this savior who had a Jewish name, a Hebrew name, Jesus, Yeshua, right? That was in their Hebrew, how they spoke the name. He kept getting arrested. He kept getting beat up. He kept getting thrown in jail. Uh, some of uh, people that he thought were with him turned against him. Some of the people he thought would, who he thought would be for him hated him and on and on. Remember, he had that thorn in the flesh. We'll see later in this letter, we think it was an eye disease. We know that he was going blind because he tells us in some of the letters that he, he, had, he, had, he dictated these letters and other, others wrote them down for us. And then he says, see with what big letters I'm writing. So he wasn't completely blind yet, but he was going blind, right? So this is not like God making light of our pain and our hurt. No, what happened? You remember Jesus when he was coming into the city of Jerusalem? Right, he saw the city and he wept. 
He saw the city because he saw all the pain and all the hurt of the people of that city. He saw all the pain and all the hurt of all the world. He knew the, the pain and the hurt that was coming on Jerusalem. Oh, he knew not long after his death, uh, the, the people of Jerusalem would launch, or, well, not just the people of Jerusalem, but the people of Israel, a certain group would launch rebellion against the Roman Empire, and the Romans would come and just utterly crush Jerusalem and the people of Israel. Jesus wept. He looks at you and me, and he weeps. So it's not God here making light of our problems. He says this light momentary affliction. We can get an attitude about those words right there. Oh, you're calling my pain, my hurt. You're causing the trauma that has caused so much pain in my life for the last 30 years, a light momentary affliction. We can get an attitude about those words or, or we can say, thank you. Thank you for giving me hope. Thank you for giving me perspective. Thank you for reminding me this is not like forever. This is not forever. Right? This is only chapter one. When my daughter Hannah died, so some of you know, many of you know, my daughter, my youngest daughter, descended into drug addiction, right? And then died of overdose. Uh, there was trauma in her life. Uh, if, when my daughter died, if I had to believe, and oh, wow, the pain and the misery that came to her in addiction, a young woman in addiction, and the people who, who did her such huge, huge wrong, if I had to believe that my daughter's life was defined by the pain and the hurt that was in her life in her years of addiction and by the, the mess in her head that, that led her ultimately to addiction, if I had to believe her life was defined by what happened to her in this world, yeah, then I'd say, forget this. But our God is telling us, no, your existence is not defined by what has happened to you in this world, right? This is a light momentary. It doesn't feel light when we're walking through it. It hurts. It hurts badly when we're walking through the pain of this world. But our God is giving us perspective here. This is just chapter one. Our God is giving us perspective here. In fact, that those who go through the greatest pain have the greatest chapters two, three, four, and five, and all the rest. We can get hope in the midst of our pain. We can get hope in the midst of our struggles, right? By keeping perspective, by grabbing hold of this perspective. So this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory. Again, the word glory, whenever you read that word, the way to understand it is the character, the character of God. The afflictions of this life in this world in chapter one right now, preparing for us something eternal, something that's going to last for all the other chapters of our eternal lives, right? An eternal weight of glory. The character of God is being not just a little bit of the character of God, a weight of glory. The character of God is produced in us, is produced in us, right, through the afflictions that we go through, through the struggles and the hardships that we go through in this world. An eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, beyond all comparison, beyond anything we can imagine. In other words, the kind of love that God is creating in our hearts that we will have for him, for those all around about us, the kind of peace that he will create, that he is creating through the afflictions of life in this world, the kind of peace that he's creating in our hearts that we will have for eternity, chapters two, three, and four, and all the rest, that we will be able to give to others for all eternity, the kind of joy he's creating in our hearts through the struggles now, through the pain, the hurt now that we will have in our hearts, that we will give to others for all eternity. It's beyond all comparison. And maybe you say, no, 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 I don't feel any love being created in my heart right now. I don't feel any peace. I don't feel any joy being created in my heart right now. Well, yeah, that's because you're still in this chapter one, right? Yeah, it's, 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 it's by faith now. That's why Paul said, the good work he began in you, he will bring to completion. 
on the day of Jesus, on the day when you see him face to face, on the day when you're looking into those eyes of perfect love. This work that he has begun in you now, he will bring to completion. And so uh, this is why, you know, we are not driven to despair. This is why we are not destroyed because we, are, we have put our faith in the promises of God. We put our faith in Jesus who said, this pain in your life is not wasted. I'm using it for great, great eternal good. I'm using it to create a, a love, a, a peace, a, a joy in you. It's beyond anything you can even imagine. And so again, we might look at this and we might say, yeah, pie in the sky, by and by, preacher. You're just telling me how to numb out my brain and all the pain of this world so I can just get through it. No, I'm telling you how to stay strong. Here's God telling us how to stay strong in this life. How to not just kind of give up on being a person who loves on being a person who brings peace, on bring, being a person who brings joy to those around you, right? You've heard how people criticize, you know, oh, he's so heavenly-minded, he's of no earthly good. It's the exact opposite. That is such a lie. The more heavenly-minded you are, in other words, the more you have your mind on, focused on the fact that the pain and struggles of this world are not wasted, but will bring a huge blessing beyond this life, the more you are able then to be of great earthly good because you're not just giving up. You're not deciding just to get whatever you can get out of life. You're deciding, I am here to bring this faith that I have. I'm here to bring the goodness of God that's come to my life to person after person after person. I'm here to feed hungry persons now. I'm here to bless persons who are forgotten and ignored now. I'm here to lift up those who have fallen now, and I'm not giving up doing it because of the problems in my life. No, all the more because of the problems in my life. I will be of great earthly good because I know what's beyond this life right now. So at verse 18, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. All this happens, Paul says, as we look not to the things that are seen. If I have my eyes on the circumstances of my life and I don't have my eyes on the things that are unseen, the promises of God, right? The, the future that God has set before me. If I have my life just on the things that I can see right now, then I'm going to say, what is the point what is the point? I've got all this hurt. I've got all this pain. I've had all this disappointment in life. What is the point? Right? Or you look around and maybe you haven't had huge pain, or at least not right now. You don't have huge pain in your life. But you look at all the pain in this world, all the tragedy in this world. If all I'm looking at is this world right now, then you say, what is the point of even trying? What's the point of feeding hungry people? There's billions of hungry people. What's the point of paying attention to people who are often forgotten or condemned or avoided, right? There's billions of people who are forgotten, condemned, and avoided. We say to ourselves, if we're looking just at the problems of this world, we're looking at the problems in, in our own lives, then we say, what is the point, right? If all I'm doing is looking at the things that are seen. But if I'm looking at the things that are unseen, if I'm keeping my eyes on Jesus, if I'm keeping my eyes on Jesus who kept loving people despite all the pain that was coming to him, who kept loving people despite all the hatred that was, you know, surrounding him, right? If I keep my eyes on this unseen Jesus, right, then what? Then this eternal weight of glory is being created. Then I'm keeping my faith in Jesus. Then God's taking the pain and the hurt and the struggles of this world and creating something awesome, something incredible in my life. And so the end of that verse 18, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. He said, yeah, the things that I can see right now, I can see the current state of affairs of my life. I can see the current state of affairs of this world. He's saying that's transient. That's here today, gone tomorrow. And you say, yeah, well, the state of my life isn't here today, gone tomorrow. It's been the same for the last 20 years. Yeah, and what is 20 years? It's the blink of an eye. 
He says, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So what does that mean? It means when I rise above, because I got my eyes on Jesus, I rise above the hurt and pain in my life and say, I am here to bless hurting people. I'm hurting, but I am going to rise above that. I'm going to get the strength in Jesus. I'm going to get the courage in Jesus to rise above my pain and be a blessing to those all around me. Then I'm going to go feed hungry people. I'm going to go love people that other people judge and condemn or forget and ignore. You know, that woman I was talking about uh, lying in that nursing home bed that I used to go and visit, right? She had nothing in this world left. Oh, but she had the treasure of Jesus in her heart. And so you say, well, how could she be a blessing? Because you know what she did? Every time I came, she insisted that I bring a prayer list of all the prayer needs in that church. She was in a bed in a not very nice nursing home. But what did she spend her time doing? Praying for all of us. And oh, yeah, she wanted me to pray for her when I came. But more than that, she wanted to pray for me. Because she... (laughs) She knew that young pastor needed a lot of prayer, right? She was praying for me. She was praying for all the people of our church. And so that's when you are heavenly minded, you're of the greatest earthly good. And guess what? The people who worked in that nursing home, who worked with her, they all loved her because she was such a blessing to them. They were people who weren't being paid very much for what they were doing. But wow, they loved to talk to her. She was so kind so loving. There she was in all her struggle. Not many people remembering her in that nursing home. And what was she being? She was being an incredible blessing. Incredible blessing to people who really had a lot of struggles in their lives, right? Those were pretty, some pretty low-paying jobs. I'm quite sure of that. And she was a huge blessing to them, praying for all of us. So when we keep our eyes on what is eternal, We keep our eyes on the promises of God. That, yeah, this world can beat me up. This world can hate me. But I'm trusting in God. I'm trusting in Jesus. Then I can keep the strength to have the, I can keep, you know, the, the strength of doing the right thing, doing what God's called me to do here in this world while I live this world, while I wait for that day to come when I will see him face to face. All right, we're going to stop there. We will start in chapter 5 at verse 1 next week. Read these verses one by one. There's so much packed into every sentence. That's kind of the problem of doing a Bible study where we're trying to do more than just a few verses every week, right? Uh, There's a lot, so it's kind of like we're going like this. But read these verses one by one. Read them out loud. Repeat each. Read you know, you're reading that, that, uh, that last verse there, verse 18. Read it once out loud. Read it again out loud. Read it slowly. Read it phrase by phrase. Read it word by word. Ask God to speak to your heart. All right, let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for these amazing promises. The struggles of this world are truly, really a light momentary affliction. And that you are taking the struggles in Uh, our lives, Lord God, if we keep our faith in you, if we keep looking to you, you will turn that, you will work that all for great good, keeping us strong in this world, giving us the hope beyond this world. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We pray, Father, for all those in our hearts right now. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Yay, get all of our Bible studies on our website, mzpraise, P-R-A-Y-S. They're all right there. God bless you. See you soon.